friends who will be joining us here now. So once again, welcome to this webinar and this monthly series, Being Lutheran. And my name is Chad Rimmer, and I'm one of the theologians on the communion office staff as a program executive in the Department of Theology, Mission, and Justice with the Lutheran World Federation. And we've been hosting these series of webinars to explore the vibrant and creative diversity of what it means to be Lutheran around the world today. And this process began with a consultation hosted last year uh, by the Evangelical Ethiopian Evangelical Church Makani Jesus in Addis Ababa on the theme, We Believe in the Holy Spirit, Global Perspectives on Lutheran Identities. And that began a rich conversation that continues today about how the Spirit calls, gathers, and liberates us uh, to, to participate in God's transformational love and service around the world today. We explored uh, biblical, liturgical, confessional, theological, uh, and spiritual foundations of our shared Lutheran tradition and the way that they're translated in our many different contexts around the globe. And it's so inspiring, as always, um, to, to see this take shape. Um, and the aim of this webinar series is to open that conversation to the whole communion and create more spaces for this kind of transcontextual theological reflection. And in that way, the stories of our friends as we're gathered here today become part of our own sense of belonging and our own self-understanding about what it means to be Lutheran. So once again, thank you to all the participants um, who were gathered and will be participating here today. As we gather, we want to open uh, in a time of prayer as, as normal. So we create this um, beautiful experience of being in communion with each other. But instead of a prayer today, recognizing that we're gathered at the beginning of the season of Advent, I would like to actually share um, one of the videos that have been submitted. The Lutheran World Federation has been sharing on social media daily posts of music from around the communion. So we are a singing communion, and of course music is part of our heritage. And so the video that was recently shared that I want to open with today is from the Lutheran Church in Denmark. And so if you'll bear with me as I start this screen share, we're gonna hear now from the youth of the Lutheran Church in Denmark uh, in this Advent hymn. So let it be our prayer as we open up this conversation here today. So let us pray.
Amen. So friends, in our conversation today, we will focus on the sixth theme that arose from the Addis consultation, and that is the need for discernment. The report from Addis affirmed a Lutheran-centered process of discerning the spirit and the spirits of the age. Now, Lutherans have always had a good foundation for critical theological reflection and a strong foundation for ethics and engaging moral discernment, not only specifically in the field of ethics, but in terms of Lutherans contributing to advocacy and dialogue in the public space. And the findings of the Addis Consultation stated the following. Lutherans put an emphasis on discerning and discerning the spirits. Oratio, meditatio, and tentatio provides a method for discerning spiritual gifts and building up of the body, as well as the spirits of the age, such as exploitative power, patriarchy, ethno-nationalism, commodification, consumerism, xenophobia, etc., which co-opt narratives of spirituality and spiritual gifts. What is important is that while Lutherans have a rich and strong pneumatology, spiritual gifts are always given in love to build up the body. And here is a special reference to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. So in order to address spiritual narratives that commodify gifts or suggest special revelations that glorify new clerical or spiritual classes, Lutherans must develop theological frames and mechanisms of discernment, tentatio, in order to equip people to differentiate between what gifts are used to build up the body in love and compassion and what gifts are being exploited through claims of special revelation and a new theology of glory as a means of commodifying grace in our age. That's from the report. So today's conversation, we'll talk about discernment, discerning the spirits of the age, 1 Corinthians, and love as a measure of moral discernment. And so we have two guests. They're going to begin our conversation here today, Reverend Dr. Dr. Simone Sin and Pastor President Atahualpa Hernandez. And we'll begin this conversation by hearing from Reverend Dr. Simona Sin. And Simona has served in years past in the communion office of the LWF um, as program executive for interreligious dialogue and public theology. She is now the professor of ecumenical theology at the WCC's Ecumenical Institute at Bosse. And in addition to being a great theologian and a dear friend, Simone is also part of Faith and Order at WCC, and part of her work is to accompany a process on moral discernment, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But this is why I'm so very glad that Simone could join us on this particular day. So, Simone, welcome, and over to you. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Chad, for the invitation uh, to contribute um, to this webinar. I'm really looking forward <clears throat> to the conversations that we're going to have around this important topic. And I'm really pleased to see a good number of familiar faces um, in this webinar and also many new faces. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. As Chad mentioned, I have been working in the area of public theology. And for me, public theology is about discernment because it engages um, us with issues of this world. We are grounded in the gospel message and trust in God's life-giving presence through the Holy Spirit and engage together in discernment processes. I would like to begin um, my opening statement uh, today with focusing our attention on a very classic Lutheran text namely the freedom of a Christian. This is an important treatise. Luther wrote it in 1520. So actually this year we celebrate 500 years of, of this important treatise as a number of other important treaties. Um, and this document has been quite important for my own theological journey. 
it has given me motivation and also a sense of direction for um, my own theology. And I, I strongly recommend everybody to read the text, but let me just um, quote the text, the classic passage um, in the beginning. Luther says, the Christian individual is a completely free Lord of all, subject to none. The Christian individual is a completely dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Although these topics appear to contradict one another, nevertheless, if they can be found to be in agreement, they will serve our purposes beautifully. For both are from the Apostle Paul when he says in 1 Corinthians 9, for though I am free with respect to all, I have made my slave, myself a slave to all. And in Romans 13, owe nothing to one another except to love one another. But love by its very nature is dutiful and serves the one who is loved. The same was true of Christ, who although Lord of all, was nevertheless born of a woman born under the law, and who was at the same time free and slave, that is, at the same time in the form of God and in the form of a slave. Now, in my view, this text um, gives us direction for discernment. By affirming freedom, Luther clearly says that nothing in this world should hold us captive. Nothing should enslave us. Human beings are called to freedom and the gospel message is in a profound sense, a message of liberation. We know it and Chad just mentioned it in his introduction when he read from the Addis report, there are many things in today's world that hold our hearts and minds, even our senses captive. But this is not how it should be. This is where we need to resist. We are called to freedom. And at the same time, when we affirm this profound calling to freedom and liberation, we also hear from Luther that we are called to be dutiful servants. This means to put the well-being of the other at the center. Dietrich Bonhoeffer underlined that we are called to be the church for others. Because our life is nurtured and carried by God's grace, our energy and attention can be freely given to others. So we no longer are inwardly turned on ourselves but outwardly turned with our whole um, energy and attention towards the other. And for me, that's the first and very basic um, uh, foundation for uh, morality in a Lutheran perspective. And interestingly, in his treatise, Luther puts before our eyes Christ, nothing less. It's focus our eyes on Christ because he embodies this in a paradigmatic way freedom from captivity and freedom to love and serve the other. Now, Lutherans um, are known for engaging in worldly issues. To say it in a casual way, we roll up our sleeves and engage and even get our hands dirty. Um, we don't withdraw from worldly issues. At the same time, we distinguish between the spiritual and the worldly realm. But this distinction between spiritual and worldly dimensions is not in order to separate them, but in order to give it its, its rightful and appropriate place. And we know that um, Lutherans have been engaged in worldly matters. Again, for me, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a classic example of someone who, even in the midst of very adversarial or uh, um, conflicting issues during the Nazi regime in Germany, he engaged with the issues of the world. And he said, we should not look for God um, kind of on the fringes only, but in the middle, in the center of life, we should engage with um, issues where we are. Um, 
yes, we might fail. Yes, we might, um, yeah, become real. Yeah, realize that we cannot uh, remain. Um, that we cannot withdraw from from difficult issues. Um, but he engaged with this world in order to be part of the transformation of the world. Now, what are the sources for um, discernment in the Lutheran tradition? Of course, these are the classic sources, um, scripture, uh, reason, catechism, hymns, word and sacrament, um, but also scientific knowledge, wisdom. So Lutherans, um, they don't often, we feel like um, the motto sola scriptura um, kind of focuses and limits us to scripture, which is really not true. The, the, sources, the sources for moral discernment are very rich in the Lutheran tradition. I would like to just quote the very classic statement that Luther did when he was in the Diet of Worms in 1521. Um, before the emperor, he was called to renounce his earlier writings. And then he said boldly, unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me, amen. So I quoted this because we see the two very important sources for discernment. One is scripture, the other one is plain reason. And we often, we often forget that, that uh, Lutherans um, appreciate scientific knowledge uh, and moral reasoning that engages with other traditions, with other schools of thought and philosophy. And then thirdly, Luther mentions in this um, situation, conscience. Now conscience, we often think of conscience in a very modern sense of the individual conscience. So I, in my own conscience, uh, um, discern this. But actually for Luther, conscience has clearly a communal dimension. Conscience is not being formed just in the inner interior in my own individual self, but the formation of conscience um, takes place within community. Um, in listening to the word of God through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we have, um, I think, I hope that we can in our discussion also try to understand what conscience means in discernment processes and how consciences are being formed. Um, finally, I would like to um, briefly focus on how do Lutherans do discernment. When we talk about um, uh, uh, conscience needing communal processes, we need to say that in order to engage with moral issues today, we need participatory processes. It's not um, the clergy or a kind of a bunch of experts who are going to discern and decide, but Lutheran discernment is a participatory process where different groups of people are involved, especially those who are affected and uh, implicated by, by the issue at stake. So for Lutherans, participatory processes are um, a very key element in discernment. And secondly, um, Lutherans believe that we need to um, analyze uh, uh, cr and critically analyze what is going on. As Chad mentioned in the opening, critical theology is an important, important part um, because at times we need to be countercultural, to ask whether what is kind of seems to be normal uh, in a given situation is what we are called to do. So we are called to be more sensitive to the most vulnerable ones. Um, and so it's the most vulnerable ones that are the yardstick for how uh, we engage in, in moral discernment. Okay, I'm running out of time, sorry. Um, I think I would conclude at this point um, and then we can engage in further conversation. Thank you. 
No, this is super. Thank you, Simone. Um, and we'll definitely want to come back both about the, the way conscious is shaped in communities, um, but how that's lived out. Um, and, and this is one reason why I'm so happy that our second guest is here to speak with us today, too, because Pastor President Atahualpa Hernandez is the president of the Lutheran Church in Colombia. And um, Atahualpa is, is a leader in the LAC region, as well as in his church, but also in one of those... Um, uh, one of, one of those settings where the church is so engaged in the public space and the kind of engagement that, that Simone is pointing us to. Um, and so in terms of the church's role in these conversations and, and the presence of the church um, in hosting these conversations, I'm so happy just to welcome Pastor President Atahualpa. And as we turn it over to him, I'll just remind everyone that if you come on, uh, if you came on after the introduction, to please choose either Spanish or English for the translation. But um, please, Pastor President Atahualpa, bienvenidos. Muchas gracias. Es para mí un privilegio, un placer poder compartir este espacio y en nombre de la Iglesia Evangelica Luterana de Colombia. Agradezco la invitación y la oportunidad de contribuir en esta segunda fase de la consulta que se realizó el año pasado en Etiopía bajo el lema Creemos en el Espíritu Santo, perspectivas globales sobre identidades luteranas. Se me ha pedido que comparta brevemente y eso es lo que espero hacer. Eh, celebro que desde las oficinas de la comunión se siga impulsando esta valiosa reflexión aún en medio de las restricciones que han sido impuestas por nuestros países en un intento de mitigar el esparcimiento del COVID-19. Y doy gracias a Dios que también en estos aspectos el Espíritu Santo guía a la Iglesia para responder de formas creativas que permiten que personas de diferentes partes del mundo estén conectadas para reflexionar sobre este importante tema, aún sin desplazarse de nuestros hogares. En mi presentación se me ha pedido que comparta algunas maneras en que la iglesia eh, ayuda a sus miembros a discernir los dones espirituales y los espíritus, como se ha denominado, de esta época. Con este fin quiero exponer en primer lugar el lugar desde donde hablo. Luego me referiré a algunas maneras en que nuestra iglesia intenta acompañar esos procesos de discernimiento comunitario y ese ejercicio de los dones eh, en los contextos locales. Y finalmente, eh, enunciaré algunas prácticas que hemos encontrado, nos ayudan a considerar eh, la relación entre esos dones espirituales y el discernimiento moral. En mi país, la mayoría de las experiencias identificadas bajo el nombre de cristianas provienen de la narrativa originada desde grupos neopentecostales. Hasta 1991, nosotros fuimos un país católico, según lo consagraba la constitución política de nuestra nación. Y tras la reforma constitucional, se dio apertura a una libertad religiosa que permitió a quienes hasta ese momento teníamos muy limitadas nuestras expresiones de fe, abrirnos a un espacio público con más fuerza. No obstante, en la práctica... Esa libertad se tradujo, por un lado, eh, en un tratamiento preferencial y privilegiado que conservó la iglesia mayoritaria, y por el otro lado, con grupos emergentes que estaban fuertemente anclados en teologías de la prosperidad. Las iglesias luteranas, presbiterianas, anglicanas, menonitas, que en Colombia son identificadas bajo el nombre de iglesias históricas, por su relación con las reformas del siglo XVI, se hallaron en medio de un gran desafío. Además del aspecto social y político que estaba vinculado a esta apertura, estaba la interacción con aquellas manifestaciones del espíritu que varias de esas comunidades hacían eh, nombrar como suyas propias, como si tuvieran el exclusivo dominio de estas prácticas. Es en ese contexto que como iglesia hacemos frente a estas realidades y queremos dar testimonio de aquello que nos une eh, como comunión luterana y que afirmamos en los credos 
eh, que creemos en el Espíritu Santo. En primer lugar, la realidad que este espacio público nos permite nos implica tener varios retos de cómo hablar y cómo dar testimonio de ser luteranos en medio de un contexto eh, que por 50 años tuvo a la nación en un conflicto interno. Uno de los aspectos que más me cuestionan a mí mismo frente a el ser denominados como un país cristiano, con un, más de un 90% que se identifica a sí mismo como cristiano, es que cuando Colombia tuvo la oportunidad de definir si en las urnas, en el, tras el, con el voto popular, apoyaban los acuerdos que se celebraron entre una de las guerrillas de, la, de Colombia, la más antigua de todo el continente, eh, su voto en mayoría, y eso tiene muchos matices y podríamos profundizar en alguna oportunidad sobre ese resultado, pero eh, el resultado en sí de las votaciones fue que eh, la mayoría apoyó el no. Y ahí me parece que hay una eh, tarea bien interesante para reflexionar como un país que se denomina cristiano, eh, frente a la posibilidad de eh, apoyar, de, de eh, referendar unos acuerdos políticos en las urnas, eh, decide que su voto es el no. Y es muy interesante porque en el mapa de Colombia, las zonas donde el no ganó son las zonas del centro, donde la mayoría de las personas viven, en ciudades donde el conflicto armado no eh, fue tan evidente, donde no hubo eh, una afectación tan directa. Y la mayoría de las zonas eh, periféricas, las zonas donde más se vio afectada eh, la población, las comunidades por la violencia, votaron sí. Entonces nos encontramos con una población que en su mayoría bajo la comodidad y la realidad de no sufrir en la violencia, prefiere decir no a los acuerdos de paz, y la mayoría de las poblaciones viviendo en la realidad más directa del conflicto diciendo sí. Y allí me parece que hay una importante tarea que como iglesia hemos intentado realizar de discernir eh, esos espíritus, como se ha llamado en, el, en con la consulta eh, de Etiopía. Eh, porque ser cristianos parece que no garantiza eh, directamente que las posturas nuestras eh, políticas frente a las realidades de violencia de marginación, de pobreza, de conflicto, eh, se, se sigan o sean eh, coherentes con lo que afirmamos acerca de un Dios que nos ha llamado a ser embajadores de la reconciliación y acerca de un Espíritu Santo que ha prometido traer paz. En ese sentido, una de las tareas más fuertes que hemos tenido como iglesia es cómo eh, hacer pedagogía para vincular la realidad de nuestro país, el contexto en el que vivimos, con intereses muchas veces económicos, políticos, por mantener la guerra, porque todos ustedes saben que la guerra es un buen negocio. Considerando este contexto desde el que hablo, permítanme entonces compartir también algunas de las maneras en las que como iglesia hemos intentado responder. Hace algunos años, y conscientes de todo este contexto, eh, intentamos desarrollar programas que ayudaran al liderazgo laico y a, al liderazgo de las comunidades locales a cuestionar, a reflexionar acerca de las situaciones que en sus propias comunidades, en, en los lugares eh, concretos donde vivían, eh, se tenían. Y cómo involucrar sus dones eh, en el servicio a esas comunidades. El programa tiene un nombre largo, Programa de Formación al Liderazgo Eclesial, eh, pero que la sigla... Eh, se ha abreviado utilizando una palabra en inglés, profile. Eh, nuestro interés es conectar este perfil de liderazgo con eh, una iglesia que quiere responder con sus dones y talentos al contexto actual. Entonces, esos líderes se preparan allí por cerca de dos años eh, para intentar responder con un eh, testimonio de servicio en sus comunidades. Y parte de los programas que eh, abordamos es esta relación con eh, los dones que Dios nos ha dado, cómo ponerlos al servicio, el sacerdocio eh, universal de todos los creyentes, la manera como otras teologías se entienden y se acercan a los dones eh, y cómo nosotros como luteranos podemos, eh, desde nuestra herencia también, acercarnos a aquello que es un regalo de Dios a través de su Espíritu Santo. 
creo que eh, finalmente es importante señalar que estamos en un proceso de aprendizaje y que estos procesos eh, han sido de alguna manera exigidos a nuestra iglesia por el contexto al que me referí en el primer punto. Así que estamos en una búsqueda y en un proceso que quiere responder a una situación eh, nacional, a una situación de país, pero que, a una situación que también vivimos en toda Latinoamérica, eh, y quiere hacerlo gozando y disfrutando de la herencia que hemos recibido, de la herencia luterana, eh, pero en diálogo con las realidades que nuestra nación eh, afronta. En este sentido, un desafío que vemos eh, y que se nutre, digamos, de las respuestas que otras iglesias dan, es cómo vincular estas eh, expresiones, estas manifestaciones que muchas veces pasan por el cuerpo, por la corporeidad eh, y que en una tradición luterana a veces desestimamos, a veces nos quedamos solo en el cerebro, cómo eh, hacer que nuestra teología y, y una teología eh, del espíritu, una neumatología, atraviese la realidad del cuerpo eh, que muchas veces en nuestros contextos latinoamericanos, está fuerte vincula, fuertemente vinculada a quienes somos, eh, quienes han estado en Latinoamérica, quienes eh, han tenido contacto con personas de esta latitud, saben eh, la importancia y la realidad que es, compartimos con otros pueblos, pero que es muy marcada en, en nuestras naciones. ¿Cómo entonces reflexionar desde sentimientos, desde, las, eh, desde la corporalidad, desde la realidad, de que somos seres creados con, con un cuerpo frente a, a la eh, acción del espíritu y cómo eso atraviesa nuestra realidad eh, en medio de nuestros pueblos. Quiera Dios que eso eh, sirva para ayudarnos a seguir reflexionando y a seguir en esos procesos de aprendizaje, como he mencionado. Muchas gracias. Yes, thank you so much. President Atahualpa, um, and you're speaking about the way that co communities embody that that ethic or that discernment in the public space. Um, and this, I want to come come around to about how how what role love plays, you know, in our discernment and how we how we um, yeah embody that witness. Um, and I want to thank just to say a word of thanks in terms of the church in Colombia for that witness where you are and for hosting those spaces. Um, so I want to come back to that. I want to begin just with some question and conversation with Simone actually thinking about the way Pastor President Atahualpa has described the church in hosting those processes of discernment. Um, you're in your work, Simona, you're involved in the process um, of moral discernment on the side of the WCC, um, which, you know, is aiming at creating kind of that framework for this kind of discernment within churches, um, you know, a, a process sort of what Pastor President Atahualpa is pointing at. So I wonder, Simona, if you can just kind of describe where, you know, the status of, of that work and what are some of the concepts you're finding helpful in that strategy to help equip churches to, to host these kinds of discernment and conversations? Yes, thank you very much. Um, the WCC has been engaging um, in these questions and, and particularly also the Faith and Order Commission uh, because some of the moral discernment processes have become quite difficult because there was serious um, disagreement, not only diversity, but, but really disagreement. Um, and let me start from that kind of more sensitive and difficult part of discernment. Um, whenever a church responds to a concrete situation and whenever they reach out in love um, um, to embrace the most vulnerable or, or people who have been discriminated against, um, they might come to conclusions more in their moral um, discernment that other churches then might find very difficult um, to deal with. And actually this was the starting point for the WCC. And just to name it um, directly that um, as in, in recent decades, um, societies and churches have um, struggled with the question of how um, to welcome and, and open up to the LGBTI community. Um, the churches have found it very, very difficult um, to talk about uh, these issues uh, because they, they found it so sensitive. Um, 
And then the WCC said, but we need to be able to know what are the sources. So this is why the first uh, moral discernment document that was published in 2013 identifies sources for discernment, saying that if we, in our discernment journey, um, come to a, a new understanding, it's not that we are just following what society is doing. No, this is not the case. It is that churches have their own processes in response um, to situations in society. Um, and it's not just something out there in society, but it is within the church itself. And, and so the moral discernment process tries to clearly say, we have different sources um, for discernment. And I, I mentioned them, but I just want to um, really read out. So this is the document that came out in 2013, Moral Discernment in the Churches. And they start off as first uh, source of authority, guidance of the Holy Spirit. So listening to the Holy Spirit is kind of the starting point and what carries through the whole process. Then scripture, tradition, teaching authority, spirituality, church culture. So these are faith sources or resources for discernment. And then they have a second section where they focus on human reason and other sapiential sources for moral discernment, meaning wisdom. So they have reason, natural law, natural, social and human sciences, conscience, experience, civil law and human rights, and in the end, um, culture. So it was very important for us to see these, these many fold factors that influence our discernment process. Um, and to say that we need to stay in conversation and in dialogue. So yes. this is what, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and at the moment we have, we are just finalizing a, a second um, study document that will be brought to the Faith and Order Commission meeting in January 2021, um, that tries to analyze um, how churches actually deal with the question of continuity and change. Because for many churches, it is a challenge that um, suddenly, I mean, we have been teaching this for centuries, and but suddenly the church comes to the conclusion that it actually needs to change its moral teaching. Another example is Christian engagement in war and peace building, uh, where um, for, for centuries, um, Lutherans have been rather on the side of um, kind of arguing for why a Christian can be a soldier and so on. And we, it was mostly only in the 20th century that Lutherans also found a, a rationale for why, um, a rationale for conscientious objection for not going to war as a, a Christian vocation. Um, so in the second study document, we um, look into this question of continuity and change which are um, the, the sources that help us to stay in continuity, faithful to the gospel, but at the same time, be accountable um, um, to the most vulnerable and um, to envision a, a community that is a koinonia. A koinonia, this is the Greek term that describes this communion, this uh, communion of love, basically. And so our the, the subtitle for the new document will be um, facilitating dialogue to build koinonia. So the key criterion is what builds koinonia. And koinonia does not mean majority vote. Koinonia really means to expand of how we think of, of the community. Yes, and this brings us back to the, to the love imperative. Um, so on the one hand, we're talking about Lutherans making a pivot not only from that conversation about faith and works but faith and reason and really engaging these different sources um, and dialogues with natural sciences with um, civil society with with interfaith and and political spheres and things like this um, and on the other hand needing to lift up um, the, the primacy of love as a as as one of the one of the contributions 
that the Christians make to discernment. And I want to come. I want to come back to that in 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 a second. Um, but I want to ask Pastor President Atawaba. Um, one of the issues that we struggle with, of course, is the shrinking spaces for churches to have these conversations. And I know within the church in Colombia, you've been holding these spaces for discernment, both in the public space, but also within the church, like Simona is, is pointing us to. Um, so I wonder if you can just describe maybe what are some of the struggles um, well, you did describe in your, in your introduction the, the difficulties that the church has in holding that space, but what are some of the ways that you use within the church to, to host these conversations that you described? How is it that you're managing to call together the church to engage in these processes of discernment together? Muchas gracias. Creo que una, una de las maneras como se continúa teniendo la posibilidad de dialogar esos espacios es porque nosotros mismos como iglesia vivimos la realidad de las tensiones, de las confrontaciones, de los desacuerdos, eh, de, de la necesidad de dialogar sobre aquellos temas en los que no estamos de acuerdo. Eh, es decir, cuando compartimos eh, hacia afuera eh, con nuestro país, con eh, otras iglesias, en un ambiente ecuménico, no lo hacemos considerándonos mejores que ellos, sino entendiendo que nosotros mismos vivimos las realidades de, difíciles, de eh, conflicto, de tensión, de desacuerdo en nuestra propia iglesia. Eh, y creo que eh, eso nos ha ayudado un poco a ser humildes y a reconocer que no tenemos las respuestas sino más bien a que estamos en un proceso de discernimiento, a que nosotros mismos como iglesia estamos compuestos por personas eh, que viven la realidad que el, el mismo país afronta. Solo por referirme nuevamente a, a la realidad de conflicto en mi país, eh, las personas que componen nuestras comunidades, nuestra iglesia, eh, son personas que a diario tienen que enfrentarse en su vida cotidiana con estas realidades. Entonces, si bien las noticias y los medios a veces las colocan en un plano nacional o en la realidad de eh, quienes hacen las leyes o quienes están en estas altas esferas, nuestras comunidades están compuestas por personas que viven esa misma realidad, pero en un plano cotidiano. Entonces, como iglesia abordamos estos temas eh, no porque los tengamos solucionados, sino porque los vivimos al interior de, de nuestros propios espacios, porque nuestras propias comunidades eh, para volver al tema de los dones, por ejemplo, eh, se preguntan y, y tienen diferentes posiciones acerca de, de esas expresiones, de esas manifestaciones. Y, y en la consulta, en el, en el informe de, de la consulta en Etiopía, salía este como uno de los temas, ¿no? Cómo, cómo eh, entender esas diferencias, cómo eh, vivirlas como parte de nuestra riqueza, pero siempre con una sólida eh, entendimiento, discernimiento de, de la realidad o, o de de aquello que nos une como, como luteranos en el mundo. Entonces, eh, yo creo que eh, simplemente hablamos y participamos en el espacio público, en los espacios ecuménicos, eh, desde la realidad de que nosotros mismos como iglesia vivimos esta experiencia eh, que es dolorosa, que, que es difícil, pero que, que es la realidad y que nos insta a, a responder, eh, no porque sepamos la respuesta, sino porque estamos en el proceso de, de buscarlas y, y estamos en el proceso de construirlas. Thank you. Um, and th this for me raises also, um, brings us back to that question of, of love as operational, as a measure of our, of our discernment in terms of what, why is it so difficult? Because Simone pointed already, you know, to the fact that it's not only our dialogue with the outside world. So the spirits of the age, which Lutherans have always done so well in, um, you know, I think uh, Simone, you pointed to Bonhoeffer's example. Um, also, our engagement most recently, perhaps one of the one of the examples is our engagement with apartheid. Um, um, these, um, you know, these these situations that exist in public space that we can engage um, with good moral discernment. 
Um, but oftentimes, when we are a communion together, when we're when we're discussing you know these issues in the church, whether it's in the ecumenical context or within the context of the Lutheran World Federation, it's 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 difficult. Um, and our strategy in the LWF actually points to this call to um, you know work together through the issues that divide the task of of communion, um, and. In that sense, I, I want to go back, Simone, to the point you brought up about the location of moral discernment. Because you, you know, you pointed to the Diet of Worms, where Luther says he, he raises the, the issue of conscience. But conscience is not, you know, the the individual mind, the rationale that we think of um, in many parts of the world today. So the church as the location, um, you know, for that kind of discernment. Um, I, I just want to ask, you know, how, how have you seen that? Have you seen that take shape, you know, in churches or in church processes where these, these um, you know, the, 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 the attention was placed on these communal processes of doing moral discernment so that we arrive together at that consensus um, of conscience rather than just the individual conscience. Yes, indeed. I, I think it, it takes place in many ways and on many levels. So I think each parish council or congregational council up to the regional and national level of, of church synods has been um, engaging with questions. And we see that if, if we really struggle with a, a profound moral issue, it's not just one meeting of a synod that will resolve the issue. It takes time. It, it takes several meetings. It even takes years. And people would engage um, um, yeah, different uh, different groups in order to listen, because I think this is so important. And this differs, I, I would say, um, that of course there are clear moral norms um, that give guidance, give orientation, but but Christian life is not just about implementing norms. And I think we should simply state this clearly: Christian life is to love. And in order to love, the norms are there to help us to love. Um, and I, I clearly see this, for example, in how Luther interprets the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments tell us mostly of what we should not do, but Luther interprets them in such a way mm -hmm. that it, it, it expands actually our vocation. It's not only um, not to give false witness, but to actually proactively speak well of the other. And you can go through all the different commandments. And for me, that is an example of um, how we interpret uh, the Bible in such a way that it, it um, gives space for the fullness of life. And I think we really need to engage in a, in a Lutheran hermeneutic of scripture. Um, and and we, we, I mean, the LWF has been doing that. Uh, there, there has been a very good process on, on uh, biblical hermeneutics. And uh, I'm glad that in very practical ways this continues because we need to engage what is written in such a way that it actually embodies love um, for the other. And that for me is, is very important. We know in the secular world, there is a very clear, plain principle that is called do no harm. And I think do no harm is like a basic standard. Um, it's a basic standard within our families. It's a basic standard within our communities. Um, and that is, what we are called to, and unfortunately, we have to say that even within churches, we don't abide by that very basic rule. But this basic rule is there. We, we need to fully embrace it and even go beyond. We need to understand where are the places where people experience harm. And I often feel that we don't have the eyes to see. We don't have the, the ears to hear the cries. So for me, doing ethics is actually um, helping people to see, helping people to hear what is actually happening to them. So um, to love is not just um, um, kind of to, to be um, kind of turned towards the other in a diaconal serving uh, uh, way, but really to 
listen to the other and to understand his or her situation. Um, and it, it's coming out of that, I would say, um, compassionate, in a very profound sense, compassionate being with the other, that we then slowly realize <clears throat> what serves the other um, and, and how we can be, as, as Luther said, a dutiful servant to all. So being a dutiful servant to all means engaging in listening. And sorry, this is my last point. Often we think discernment is about deciding. Yes, there is a deciding, a, a, a moment uh, when we need to decide. But this moment comes actually rather late. Uh, the discernment, first of all, means um, to listen, to try to go deeper, to understand, um, to take into new um, knowledge and so on. And that is a long process. And the, the moment of decision can only happen when we have a consolidated understanding of the situation. And this is now we're coming back to the to topic of the Holy Spirit. This is why the Holy Spirit is so important. The Holy Spirit is not just saying click, this is the decision to be taken. No, the Holy Spirit is that accompaniment of, of the process of, of listening. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm very passionate about this. No, it's, it's thank you. And this is actually, the, this is one of the points that I want to loop in here too. And I, I recognize it, we're, we're at the time we want to, we want to head off into some small groups to have good discussion and then come back to plenary. But, um, you know, the, the, the measure of love, love as both the path and the, and the goal. Um, last conversation it was, uh, we spoke about the fact that this faith is quorum Deo and quorum mundo, meaning the way we are with God, the justification and love we receive is active and compels us to be that way towards um, the world. And today, we're, you know, we're talking about how to discern what is that, what is that step? What is the, the path forward? Um, and one of the things that I recognize is that in different ways of doing ethics, there are a lot of there are a lot of um, metrics that you can quantify. You know, if it's the greatest good or the least suffering, um, there are different schools of thoughts about how to discern ethically. But um, you know, love is not quantifiable in in that sense it's it there's a quality of what what is the loving action in this moment and then i'm freed by christ to do that um and and i just want to put on the table too that luther i think one of the places where we see this happen in real politic is in the economic sector where luther is writing about trade and usury right and he basically he has a whole ethic here about how the economy needs to be uh, embedded in the earth. But he has, this is where he uses the phrase, the law of love. So rather than the economic law of interest, we have to share risk. And if someone has a bad year with their crops, then the financier ought to not demand profit or interest from the farmer, right? Because the it was something in the earth that was out of their control. And he, he introduces the concept of the law of love in order to mitigate the economic law, the economic situation, right? So it was a very, like, like you're saying, it's not that love is just a quality or an emotion. There's actually a way to respond and, and have a loving response change the other metric, whether it's political or economic, right? So this can operate um, in the real world. Um, and I think for the, just maybe a last comment before we go to small group, Pastor President Atahualpa, this was one of the issues that was raised at the, um, at the, in the consultation in Addis. And it was actually our Vice President Nestor who presented a paper about love being resistance to these other narratives. Um, and I wonder, you know, in some of the processes that you've been engaged in in Colombia, have you seen, you know, places where the church has been able to make, you know, bear witness to what love would look like in this situation and, and lead to new action on behalf of the church?
quisiera responder refiriéndome a una eh, experiencia que justo sucedió este primer domingo de Adviento. Eh, como iglesia eh, acompañamos procesos de reconciliación y de diálogo entre comunidades que eh, sufrieron la violencia eh, y excombatientes. Y el domingo, este domingo de Adviento, tuve la oportunidad de estar en una actividad donde comunidades campesinas, afrodescendientes, indígenas y firmantes del acuerdo, excombatientes, eh, nos reunimos para, a partir de un acto simbólico, una vasija que ellos habían pintado, hermosa, eh, fue quebrada para mostrar que esa es la realidad de, de muchas de son las realidades de la, de la violencia, de la guerra. Y luego se invitó a los participantes a, a unir los pedazos y a tratar de, de volver a hacer esa vasija. Eh, fue un momento muy emotivo, fue un momento lleno, inspirador, eh, porque las, algunas personas estaban muy bravas, porque muy eh, eh, malhumoradas, porque su obra, su trabajo se había quebrado. Eh, y y podían luego identificar que esa era la realidad como comunidades, que, que la violencia no nos ha dejado, sino, sino esas realidades de, de pedazos quebrados, rotos. Pero luego invitábamos a, a considerar que también como nos uníamos en el esfuerzo de reconstruir esas vasijas, podíamos tener acciones concretas para, para eh, recuperar y para volver a construir. Y, y una de las cosas que más me impactó personalmente fue ver niños, niños de las comunidades campesinas, de las comunidades indígenas, de las comunidades afrodescendientes y de quienes firmaron los acuerdos de paz de, de excombatientes, niños compartiendo, niños y niñas compartiendo juntos esta dinámica y era un signo de esperanza para mí. Yo creo que, como tú has mencionado, eh, esto no se puede cuantificar, no, no puedes poner en un reporte bueno, puedes hacerlo, puedes decir cuántas personas asistieron, pero eso no dice nada de lo que estaba realmente pasando eh, en esta comunidad. Eh, me parece a mí lo que estaba sucediendo es que esa esperanza que, que en Adviento recordamos eh, sucedía allí en, en realidad, en una comunidad que sufrió la violencia, pero que ahora está intentando eh, reconstruir eh, su vida, su tejido humano como comunidad. Así que yo coincido que... Eh, es en el amor, es, es a partir del amor eh, visto allí en, en estas comunidades, en nuevas generaciones que, que pueden crecer en un país diferente, que, que es posible ver también el, el, el obrar del espíritu eh, en medio nuestro. Thank you, thank you, Pastor President. And, and in a sense, that's a great story, example of how love is what is transformative. Um, And, and that, you know, liturgy even, liturgical spaces um, are places for love to take, take, to be embodied and for the spirit to, to be moving um, and speaking in new ways. Um, thank you both. And actually this is a, this leads into the question that we want to send you into your small groups with. Um, the question that I want to pose to you in your small groups is, does your congregation or church have processes or spaces for moral discernment in community? Now that could be within your community or holding the spaces um, within society, within public space in some of the ways that we're talking about. So does your congregation or church have processes or spaces for moral discernment in community? Um, first, I want to thank Pastor President Atahualpa and Simone for starting this discussion and for modeling this, this theological reflection together. Um, we'll take 15 minutes in our small groups to, to dialogue over that question, and then we'll come back into plenary and have a little time. Um, again, the small group space is a safe space. There's no moderator. Um, please take care of each other. Um, when we come back, we won't ask that you need to share what you spoke about, but it will be an open space for you to reflect together and then to continue to ask uh, any questions to Simona and Atawapa when we come back again. So thank you, friends, and we'll 
set the uh, timer and send you off into the rooms and I'll gently call you back at the end of the 15 minutes. So thank you, friends. Here it is, you should receive uh, an invitation to join in the small groups. And there are a couple here that I still need to assign. Thank you very much. And with that, friends, we've come to the end of our time. We're a few minutes over. Um, this, this, this always happens. We need to have whole days for these conversations. Thank um, you. But we really want to just uh, take a moment to say thank you to our guests, our presenters, Simone and President Atahualpa, your, your sharing and the way you helped shape this conversation was, was rich and um, just precious. And I thank you so much. And Elias, for translating, as always, Yeoman's work, um, and for each of you participants who keep coming to share your, your life and your faith here, because it really expands our understanding of what it means to be Lutheran and this experience um, of being together. So as always, I pray that this has been inspiring to you, and I invite you to keep coming back. We continue the series in the new year, but please be aware that that the next one on January will actually be on the 13th. The first Wednesday of the month is Epiphany, so we will not come together on Epiphany, but uh, um, it will be on the 13th of January. And I just wanna close finally, knowing that we're in Advent and we're all keeping watch for Christmas